Crisis Control, brought to you by Zerilio. Cybersecurity experts protecting Australian businesses and organisations so we can all be safer together. Sherlock and welcome to Crisis Control as we take a deep dive into the risks facing business today to discover how smart companies are using technology to reduce risk and bring real rewards. On today's program, Office Platform Wars, we examine the transition to the cloud, what platforms are winning at the expense of others, as well as address critical worker shortages across the economy. First, let's take a closer look at cloud adoption and these so-called Office Platform Wars. The pace of digital transformation, already fast, was put on warp speed by the global pandemic. Benefits of migration to the public cloud intensified as work patterns changed, supply chains were digitised and customer expectations evolved. They don't even have to run servers to um, maintain their customer data or to be able to build new software applications, even if they're internal software applications, to run the business. But a full migration remains a challenge with security a major hurdle. It's not automatic, I guess is the most important takeaway. It's not just because you move to the cloud, you're instantly safe and everything's instantly secure. You still have to take steps to set things up properly to, to harden and lock down your, your cloud instance, your cloud tenants, so that uh, it's harder for hackers and attackers to come in and steal your data and compromise your business operations. In a recent report commissioned by Telstra Purple, Omdia found Australian organisations are not well prepared for the next wave of cloud migration. The top five concerns in moving to the public cloud are different for SMEs compared with large firms. Most attacks are business email compromise attacks, where they're coming after your work email, and most work emails already in the cloud. Going forward, cybersecurity is a growing and uh, increasing area of uh, necessity, and so the resource allocation has to grow. In fact, Omdia reports inadequate preparedness to address cloud security is the top constraint to Australian enterprises' faster public cloud adoption. By contrast, security is the number three constraint globally. There's always some lag time as public policy has to catch up sort of to the state of art, uh, state of the art, and we're seeing that with, with the cloud. Um, there is a big effort in Australia um, to get the major public cloud providers like Amazon and Microsoft and Google to build data centers onshore. Public cloud providers such as Microsoft, Google and Amazon are thriving as more businesses outsource their data centers to the big providers. They are pretty much hoping and assuming that you know how to set up your cloud correctly. A lot of businesses don't realize that there is some risk and that they need to bring their own um, resources and expertise to the party if they want their cloud to be truly secure. Your responsibility to secure your data doesn't go away because you're using a cloud from a major tech company. Now, they all have great internal security, but that does not automatically transfer to all of your data and to your specific cloud tenancy. And between the big providers, will there ultimately be a winner in the office wars? There's going to be a very long-term battle for um, supremacy and dominance in terms of these, these clouds. And as personal clouds and work clouds kind of start to, um, the lines start to blur a little bit more, it's going to be very interesting to see how it all plays out and who, who ends up on top. Joining me today is Chris Chalaya from Oracle, Rene Devere from Cloudera and Michael Horton from HCL Technologies. Welcome to the program. Firstly, let's go to Chris. Uh, what is the state of cloud adoption in Australia? Well, thank you, Amber. That's a, that's a great question. And uh, we see rapid adoption of cloud in, in the region here. If I were to look at Gartner's numbers, I think that puts it at 19 billion in the market, growing north of uh, 30 percent. And that's really just the tip of the iceberg because we still see only about 20 percent of that spend uh, is on workloads in the cloud today. So really, customers in Australia. Australia do get cloud economics and they do get the benefits that it brings and there's plenty of understanding of that in the market and, and at Oracle we're here to help customers 
um, with you know our investment in public cloud regions in Sydney and Melbourne and basically making them available to certified secure and certified strategic cloud services in the market. And we're really here to help customers and bridge that gap between what's on premise today, running their core systems and building tomorrow's innovation. And how do they do that seamlessly across these environments? Because what's holding customers back, if anything, today is not an understanding of the span, it's the complexity in adoption. And they're looking at vendors like Oracle. The onus is on us as a cloud hyperscaler to help them address it, to meet them where they are, either to take those workloads to the public cloud or to bring the public cloud to them uh, on premises you know, in a very secure fashion, or to help them across you know, multiple cloud providers in a multi-cloud strategy. Renee, let's bring you in now. What are some of the benefits of moving to the cloud? So there are lots of different options um, with clouds and each one of the different clouds have their benefits. Um, different clouds have different services. And um, as Chris just said, cloud is kind of front and center. That's where people want to go. It's it's cool and it's um, it's it's where you know companies are seeing where they're going to be able to get the most value in the future. Um, so you know there's a lot of different benefits. Different workloads have different um, benefits depending on where you're going to run them. So there might be benefits. Uh, what are the challenges, I guess, that need to be addressed to make the most of today's cloud environments? Yeah, so th that's where I think um, companies that we're working with are getting stuck, where they're kind of like, yes, cloud is cool, and yes, that's where we want to go. But then, you know, the reality of it kind of sinks in. Uh, the two major things that we we see as challenges are, you know, um, we're a data, Cloudera is a data platform, and we work with companies to kind of um, get all their data together and get insight out of their data. One of the major things is having a lot of those different er different areas of data um, on different areas, on different clouds. So you have multiple systems, each part of the organization might be working with a different cloud. Uh, some of them might be on-prem and putting those together and integrating them into a cohesive solution is one of the big things. Um, another thing is, you know, data security um, and generally security and governance of your content and of your data. Uh, you know, it's a great idea and customers want to move to cloud, but then they get stuck with their regulations and compliance and, and all kinds of security concerns. So that's where we're seeing a lot of the challenges in, in, Australia, in Australia today. Chris, Renee mentioned about customers maybe not happy about moving to one particular cloud form. What are you seeing? No, we see exactly that. I think, you know, there's a massive trend for customers looking at which workload fits which cloud best and each cloud provider has you know, different uh, 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 value propositions and benefits. I think there's a common set of services that are table stakes for every cloud provider to bring to the table. So compute network and storage and doing that at scale and be very, very competitive. And then what you bring on top of that are things like security services and data modeling services and, and machine learning capability that can help draw some differences to, to Renee's point earlier customers data is all over the place and you know we pride ourselves in helping customers you know with data is in oracle's dna we pride ourselves in helping customers you know curate that data regardless of where where it is and bring that into outcomes that they're looking to see uh, uh, for their business so i think you're right data is all over the place customers get to pick where they want to leave it um, and uh, it's up to the cloud providers to make sure that we deliver a great experience for what we offer on our cloud, but also help them to curate content across those different environments and to Renee's point earlier, keep them safe across those different environments. Uh, Chris, are you finding customers are very worried about security? Absolutely, absolutely. Security, you know, is, is, is in the top two spend areas here with customers. It's typically security and sort of data analytics and machine learning that are sort of the, the, the high spend. And I think this is again, um, you know, where I think, you know, we work with our customers to show them uh, and what we do as a, you know, as providing a zero trust environment. When it's very, very important in a, in a data, when you're uh, the custodian of data for customers to see what you can do to uh, make them comfortable with the fact that we don't see your data, we host your data, but we don't see your data. So it's absolutely an area uh, of, uh, of concern for customers and we help them with a ground up zero trust architecture. But we also help them by reducing areas like removing the mundane because a lot of security breaches happen when 
mundane things don't happen, mundane things like patching your environment and patching it for known vulnerabilities. Not doing that opens up security vulnerabilities. Uh, and so by taking that away from the customers, taking as a cloud provider, taking on more responsibility to do that for them, um, we differentiate uh, for the customers and it makes it more compelling to move the, uh, uh, to the data to the cloud. Renee, many organisations are taking a leap into the hybrid data cloud environment without taking the entire digital transformation into account. Why are they doing this and what's been the result? Yeah, so this is definitely a common theme that we're seeing where uh, businesses want to go to the cloud and having um, all these different hybrid solutions and on-prem solutions um, means that their data is split and siloed. Um, you know, we recently had an event and I, I got to speak to a lot of uh, people in this in this field and they were all saying, you know, data is it's part of our IT, it's not part of our strategy, um, it's an afterthought, it's not really kind of driving the business. And so without putting your cloud strategy and your data strategy as part of your business strategy, you're basically um, setting yourself up to create siloed solutions that aren't going to work work well into the future and not be scalable. Um, another, another thing that we're finding is um, we had a recent survey uh, that set about 70% of Australian businesses were having a problem with democratization of data. So, you know, people can't access the data when they need to. Um, so that's kind of a, a regular point of contention, I think, with any cloud solutions where, you know, you on the one hand want to be able to give people the capabilities they need and be able to access what they need, but you're also worried about the governance of that, of the security of the data. So, you know, if, um, you, if you let everybody access everything, you're actually going to have security problems internally also. So, so that's, you know, something that is very big to plan for and to think. Uh, to think about when you're planning it. Um, what we're doing at Cloudera now recently, um, we're, we're talking about data fabric, which is an architecture that allows you to, to plan for having the data as part, an inherent part of your cloud strategy. And when you do that, what you're doing is you're planning for the future and you're planning for a solution that's going to, um, that's going to be able to go forward and enable you to uh, get the most data-driven insight out of your out of your data and be able to make decisions based on that. Let's bring you in now, Michael. Uh, employee shortages are well known at the moment. How can adoption of technology help to address this? Well, Amber, it's going to both help and also hinder as well because there's so much demand for IT skills at the moment. So the Tech Council of Australia, they um, they forecast that in the next two years we need 286,000 additional IT workers in Australia. Um, it's very clear that that's not going to come from our universities. We've had skilled migration halted for the last couple of years with the border closures. And it's happening at the same time that we've got exponential growth in requirements of the systems. Um, we've got organisations that need to transform their, their old systems. And you know, if you look at the banking uh, the government, defence systems, these are all developed on platforms back in the 1960s, 1970s, and a lot of those core platforms still exist and, and need to be further transformed to go to cloud. And this is happening at the same time that you've got exponential growth and need. And, you know, when you look at even the platforms that we're speaking on today, these have only been around for the last couple of years. The, the take up on it's been just massively quick, particularly um, it was uh, the 13th of March 2020 when we all went into lockdown. Everyone reverted to working on these sort of platforms, so the demand is just increasing. And then when we look forward and you look at what could happen with the data and uh, just look at the data that comes from a single electronic you know, electric vehicle, imagine when they start interacting with um, intelligent roads and things like that, and that's just one tiny area. Where, where the data is just going to be a huge avalanche. So um, yeah, huge skills shortage. Um, there's no doubt it's it's helping um, organizations the data, the digital transformation, but for most companies, it's just keeping going and keeping alive and, and uh, keeping their businesses afloat at the moment, Amber. Are you seeing any trends regarding the workforce at the moment? And where do you see it going, say, over the next five years? Yeah, well, the trend is definitely everybody across all sectors um, is looking for workers. And, you, and at times you think, where have all these workers gone? But it's just been a huge shift. And and thankfully, in Australia, our economy is very strong. And I, and I think most 
economies are, their underlying economy is very strong and there's a lot of work uh, to be done. And at the front of that work is always the IT. So that, that's the area that's feeling the pain first. So where, where you see huge demand in IT, later on you're going to see big capital projects come through. Renee, uh, let's go back to you. How is moving to the cloud helping companies become more data driven? So um, I just wanted to add uh, a point about the skill shortage here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> one has that we're seeing la landing really well and um, something that our company is kind of moving towards now is um, a SaaS solution. So we recently launched our SaaS product and what we're finding is with the skills shortage, um, it's the message about that is landing really well. And what I mean is um, we recently, for example, had a customer that their whole data platform was run by one or two people and they were very concerned that with the great res resignation, these people are going to leave and they are going to be stuck. So having a SaaS solution actually made it possible for them to, you know, have the security that they won't need these people and they're not going to get stuck without somebody managing their data platform. So I think that if, if we're talking about trends, kind of letting go of management of things and, and recognizing that possibly finding um, IT people is going to get more difficult um, is driving more of the cloud of the SaaS thing. At least that's what we're seeing. So. Uh, yeah, uh, Chris, you're nodding too. Yeah. Is it, do you agree? Yeah, absolutely. You know, data is going to be a balance sheet item for all of these customers, and boards are going to be, and companies are going to be valued on how you know effective their data strategy is. And I think what we're seeing more and more is if we can help customers address that by you know um, uh, making it simpler to remove barriers like security through things like autonomous management, autonomous patching of these environments, but also where data can't leave environments, making it simple for customers to take the cloud that's public generally, but also give them that identical experience. And we've launched something called the cloud at customer, the dedicated region cloud at customer. It's a public cloud made for a single tenant inside their firewall within their control. So all of the cloud capabilities that we talked about, uh, the decentralizing of, of data, the usage of data across ecosystems, but in a highly governed, highly regulated sort of environment. So I think that's going to that's going to be a big part of it, you know, to address the shortage. If the, the cloud providers and the vendors can help customers address the security concerns, but also address the automation concerns um, so that the customers can just get on with it, get on with doing things that you know, moves the business forward, getting things done. And Chris, perhaps where do you see it in about five years? Uh, you know, to the last two years, we've seen such an explosion and, and such growth. Uh, what are we looking at in five years' time? Look, I think I think the cloud is going to get closer and closer to the edge uh, as we think. You know, uh, we talked. I talked about data being a balance sheet item. Um, machine learning is then the next is the next step forward, right? So when you've got data and algorithms working together, self-training each other, and then taking on more of that providing more actionable decisions for the business. And to do that, the cloud and that capability has to move closer and closer to the edge. And again, we're working with customers now that have moved the cloud all the way through the pipelines or to remote mine sites or offshore or um, uh, in ruggedized edge devices so that they can capture that. So all of that then powers you know, machine learning, uh, uh, which then again goes back to the point about addressing data shortage, helps us get better use out of the people that we have deployed in the field because they're getting decisions, uh, augmenting those decisions that are very, very data driven. And that's happening in real time at the edge. So I think the cloud's going to be right at the edge. You know, everybody's phone's going to be an element of the cloud. Already it is today, but more for personal consumption. But I think it's going to be the same for business. It's going to be right at the very edge. Uh, Michael, are there certain platforms winning at the expense of others? Uh, I would say yes. Um, you know the the hyperscalers, are, which are you know the the three Googles, the Amazon, the Microsoft are definitely the, the front runners. Um, and typically, we're seeing that the the large organisations are are using at least one of these platforms, if not many of them. But the base of their systems are being converted over to those. Um, so you know we know that we have to be skilled in all of these areas, and we're doing a lot of skilling and training work at making sure that we work with the hyperscalers to, to see where the demand, to try and forecast where that demand is going to be, to make sure that we've got people trained appropriately and ready for the, you know, as, they, as people shift, as customers shift to it. 
All right, well, we might have to leave it there for the day, but thank you all for joining us. It's been a fascinating discussion and a one that I know uh, will continue and be in the spotlight. Now, let's ask the CISO. So I would say three things that they should be thinking about. First of all, how do we embed uh, cybersecurity considerations into your key strategic business decisions? Now, we saw that in COVID with the increased use of digitization and people working remotely. Now that should be something that uh, should happen more frequently, more often, when you look to moving the cloud, uh, more data to the cloud or greater use of the cloud, uh, new services, new products and so on, and digital transformation. So how do you think about those cyber risks and, and cyber security issues when, you will be, uh, when you're investing in those big initiatives will be the key between success and failure, just like any other business decision. Secondly, yeah, how, do, how do risks uh, and what are the drivers of risk for cybersecurity and how would they impact you? Uh, yeah, the external threat environment is a very opportunistic environment. It's constantly changing. There's a low barrier of entry and there's some big payoffs for gangs uh, and external threat actors and internal threat actors. So yeah, how are you thinking about your risk posture, your risk appetite, if you like, uh, and understanding you can't stop everything from happening, uh, particularly in that constantly changing environment, unless you had unlimited budget and, and resources to do that. So what can you stop and what uh, should you stop? And then also be, how do you prepare a response if something was to happen, are key decisions there. Thirdly, yeah, um, if something did happen, a major cyber attack, be it on your systems or be it in a loss of data, how ready are you for the response? Uh, and a and couple of things to think about there. First of all, the good old days of business continuity plans and response plans and so on, while they are good to help build capability, they're not going to be referred to on the day. And indeed, COVID-19 response showed that. So how, how good is your muscle memory? Yeah, and what should you do with your key people in the room to keep building that muscle memory and confidence in response are two key uh, things to think about there. And in our experience, one of the best ways to do that is through real life simulations where you get to practice and rehearse your responses and do that with the board as well. And that wraps up Crisis Control for this week. I'm Amber Sherlock. Thanks for watching. Crisis Control, brought to you by Zerilio. Cybersecurity experts protecting Australian businesses and organisations so we can all be safer together.